Dear all, um, welcome to today's session of our coffee break webinar on clinical trials in the pharmaceutical area, tips and tricks for CTA negotiations. A quick introduction ahead. My name is Irina. I'm a lawyer in Taylor Westing's life sciences team in Munich, and I am advising pharmaceutical and medical device companies on regulatory aspects in the life sciences sector and all industry specific agreements. Um, a focus of my daily practice is advising on clinical trials and clinical trial agreements. So it's my pleasure to give you a quick overview um, of the most important aspects with regard to clinical trials and clinical trial agreements today. So let's uh, switch to the agenda. Um, I will start by giving you an overview of the regulatory landscape for clinical trials with medicinal products, in particular the clinical trials regulation, the CTR. Um, we will then have a look at the main novelties introduced by this CTR and then take a look at the new approval procedure for clinical trials in the European Union. After this regulatory overview, we will um, look at the most important points in the context of CTA negotiations. We will start uh, with the use of CTA templates, move forward to the contracting parties of a CTA, discuss the impact of the General Data Protection Reg Regulation, the GDPR, on the relationship between sponsor and trial sites, um, the hospitals on the one hand, and the impact of the GDPR on the drafting of the informed consent forms, the so-called ICFs on the other hand. And then we will turn our attention to a really highly negotiated provision in CTAs, the remuneration of so-called employee or service inventions by the sponsor, which is um, crucial when a German trial site conducts a clinical trial on beho behalf of a sponsor. So let's start with the CTR, the Clinical Trials Regulation. In January 2022, this new regulation on clinical trials on medicinal products entered into full force. This regulation replaces um, the former GCP directive, the Good Clinical Practice Directive, and um, through its unrestricted applicability in all member states of the European Union, the CTR leads now to a um, harmonization of the application procedure, the approval and the supervision of clinical trials in the European Union by competent authorities. Um, just to give you a quick background information, according to the European Commission when drafting the CTR, um, the experience with the former GCP directive had shown that the harmonized approach to regulating clinical trials in the European Union had only been partially achieved by the GCP directive. There have been different application requirements established by the GCP directive for the approval of clinical trials in all member states, which led uh, from the perspective of pharmaceutical companies or sponsors to increase um, costs and delays in the start of specifically multinational clinical trials, so clinical trials which uh, are to be conducted in more than one European Union member states, and from the perspective of competent authorities in the member states, the GCP directive had led to an inefficient uh, use of resources due to unnecessary multiple assessment of the same information. So it's uh, the approach of the European Commission and the CTR to facilitate the conduct and the approval of clinical trials in the European Union. Now, um, with regard to uh, the applicability of the CTR, the CTR provides for a transition period of three years for clinical trials. As of January 2023, uh, 2023, so last year, all applications for new clinical trials in the European Union had to be submitted through a new database, the Clinical Trial Information System, which I will explain to you in a few minutes. 
um, and in accordance with the new CTR requirements. And another important timeline as of uh, January 2025 and thus next year, after the expiry of the transition period of three years, all clinical trials that have been initiated under the former legal framework of the GCP directive will have to be transferred to the new CTR and the new clinical trial information system. So you have to submit all study documents uh, and enter them into the CTIS. In case you are affected um, for the transition of clinical trials initiated under this former GCP directive under the CT, uh, into CTIS, um, the EMA has published uh, questions and answers documents entitled CTIS, how to get started and how to transition to a clinical, uh, how to transition a clinical trial. So take a look uh, at this questions and answers documents in case um, um, you have a clinical trial ongoing uh, and initiated under the GCP directive. What are the main changes under the CTR to fulfill the approach to facilitate clinical trials in the European Union? So first of all, we have a new approval procedure for clinical trials, which we will assess on the next slides uh, in a few minutes. Um, we have a new database for clinical trials, the Clinical Trial Information System, the CTIS. From now on, sponsors have to submit their application uh, documents for the approval of intended clinical trials through this one central online platform, which um, acts as a communication platform between the sponsor and the member states involved in the uh, approval procedure. The submission of applications through CTIS is, and this is interesting, mandatory for both mononational and multinational clinical trials. Uh, moreover, we have new definition, definitions um, with an extensive catalog of uh, only partly new terms. Um, the CTR now contributes to a uniform understanding of the terms um, used in the context of clinical trials. The CTR, moreover, introduces a new regulatory responsibility. It provides um, the possibility of clinical trials to be conducted by more than only one sponsor, which has, the, has been the case um, under the GCP directive. So a clinical trial can now be conducted by several sponsors. Um, this is the so-called concept of co-sponsoring. Um, the primary requirement is, above all, a clear allocation of tasks and division of all sponsors' responsibilities in a written agreement to be um, concluded between all co-sponsors. And this new provision is um, intended to simplify the procedure for all um, informal networks of researchers or research institutions uh, through shared responsibilities. And the opportunity of, um, but the opportunity of co-sponsoring is not limited to only investigator-initiated trials and the like, but can also mean more flexibility in cooperation for smaller pharmaceutical companies to uh, act as co-sponsors, as well as research cooperations between the pharmaceutical industry and academic institutions on the other hand. So they all can benefit from this new option of co-sponsoring. Moreover, we have um, substantive legal requirements for the um, protection of trial subjects. Um, the provisions on the protection of trial subjects are now extensive, extensively framed with um, detailed requirements for the informed consent. We have general protective um, provisions applicable to all trial, sites, uh, trial subjects. Um, the CTR provides detailed uh, requirements for the inclusion of um, minors, adults who are not able or not capable of giving consent, um, patients in emergency situations and pregnant and breastfeeding women. And last but not least, um, the CTR has extended the retention periods. 
in addition to concrete requirements for the storage of the trial master file of the clinical trial, um, the CTR now obliges investigators and sponsors uh, to store the content of their trial master file for a period of uh, 25 years after the end of the clinical trial. So this is a novelty that should from now on be uh, specified accordingly in your clinical trial agreements. Now let's have a closer look at the approval procedure under the CTR. Um, the approval procedure is divided into three parts, as you can see on the slide. The validation procedure on the left side, the um, assessment of the application documents by all competent authorities of the member states um, where the intended clinical trial shall be conducted in the middle section, and the final deci decision um, which will be submitted by the competent authorities to the sponsor through the clinical trial information system at the end. In case of multinational clinical trials, one member state, which will be appointed by the sponsor itself, um, will take over the coordination of the approval procedure as the so-called reporting member state, RMS, as you can see on uh, the left side of uh, the slide. The validation process usually takes 10 days and it only serves to check the completeness, uh, completeness of all submitted application documents. Um, the advantage of the CTR is that the application documents only have to be submitted once for all member states, so you don't have to submit your application documents to each competent authority of all member states and each competent ethics committees of the respective member states. So it's only one application through CTIS and it will then be disclosed to all the member states and their competent authorities and competent ethics committees. So this is the big advantage of the CTR and this new approval procedure. And in addition, the application documents are now set out in Annex 1 to the CTR. It's a really extensive list, but now the sponsors do not have to comply with different requirements in each member state where they wish to conduct their clinical trial. So we have a uniform application dossier to be submitted through CTIS. Um, the validation of the application documents is um, then followed by the actual review of the application, the so-called assessment procedure, as um, stated in the middle section, which is divided into different parts. Both parts are conducted in parallel and for a period of 45 days. Part one of the assessment, or part one, is the assessment of, let's say, general and scientific aspects of the clinical trial to be reviewed by the reporting member state in its own responsibility. So choose your reporting state wisely. With regard to these general or scientific aspects of the clinical trial, this member state um, will also have the responsibility of reviewing the trial in a manner that is um, in a manner that is binding for all participating member states in which the clinical trial is also to be, to be conducted. A deviation of the member states from the assessment of the reporting member state to this part one um, is only permitted in strict exceptional cases. So this is one more mechanism to uh, speed up the approval procedure. Now, part two of the assessment concerns um, the ethical and national aspects of the clinical trial. And um, this part two assessment will be conducted by each member state concerned in their own responsibility and for their own territory. And just to give you an an impression of the scope. Um, the scope of this part two review by the member states concerned mainly um, comprises national aspects such as the safety of the trial subjects, uh, the review of the ICF, for example, the qualification of the clinical trial team and the suitability of the trial sites. Um, the approval procedure lets 
let's just uh, skip the extension periods in um, uh, in the middle section, the approval procedure ends with one binding decision as to whether the clinical trial may be conducted, may not be conducted, or may only be conducted subject to uh, specific conditions. And the sponsor will receive one decision, uh, one approval through CTIS. Now let's move forward to the CTAs and the CTA negotiations. Mm, most of our, our clients use their own CTA templates to start the CTA negotiations with the trial sites. But um, depending on the countries where the clinical trial shall be conducted, you should be of you should be aware of the fact that there might be binding or semi-binding CTA templates published by competent authorities or competent ethics committees, which is the case, for example, in France or semi-binding in Italy, Hungary and Greece. So please don't be surprised when a trial site rejects your CTA template and refers to the binding CTA templates in this specific country. With regard to those binding or um, semi-binding CTA templates, um, the scope of permitted changes depends on the respective member states and um, concerns highly likely um, commercial aspects between the sponsor and the trial site, such as the budget and payment provisions. So please align with your lawyer on uh, the changes you wish to implement in such a binding CTA template prior to submitting prior to submitting such CTA for approval to the competent authorities in order to avoid rejections and delays in your clinical trial. One more novelty for today. At the beginning of this month, uh, the so-called German Medical Research Act was passed in Germany, which also has an impact on the conduct of clinical drug trials in Germany. Um, on the one hand, the review periods for um, solely mononational clinical trials to be conducted in Germany are now shortened. There are a few other novelties um, um, which uh, you can um, get uh, familiar by uh, yeah, just um, checking uh, this um, German Medical Research Act. Um, on the other hand, um, apart from uh, the legal novelties, um, the Federal Ministry of Health has announced um, the publication of sample contract clauses for clinical trial agreements, which is new in Germany. Um, these um, sample clauses are not yet available. However, you should keep an eye on the current developments and check uh, when uh, these contract clauses are published by the Federal, Federal Ministry of Health. Um, these contract clauses will have an impact on your contract negotiations, also not binding. Um, it is to be expected that um, German trial sites uh, might insist on the use of these sample contract clauses or at least on the use of certain provisions in order to significant, significantly speak, speed up contract negotiations. But um, these clauses can, of course, um, provide a basis for all sponsors to draw up their own CTA templates if they do not yet have their own templates uh, drafted. However, we always recommend um, that you uh, critically review the uh, individual provisions and adapt them to your specific needs, for example, to amend um, the provisions on the protection of your confidential information or the transfer of IP and not to implement and use them without any um, further review. Another initial question is, who shall be the contracting parties to the CTA besides the sponsor, of course? Only the trial site or the investigator or both? The answer, as always, depends on the member state where the clinical trial is to be conducted. In Germany, for example, trial sites usually object to enter into three-party agreements. 
um, with the investigator being a contracting party besides the trial site. And uh, the trial sites usually insist on entering into the CTA with a sponsor without the investigator being a, contract, a contracting party. The reason for this is simple. Um, German trial sites want to avoid that the investigator um, becomes liable under the CTA for any misconduct and uh, is then subject to claims made by the sponsor towards the investigator. But in Poland, for example, um, Polish law deems it necessary that um, the investigative investigator becomes a contracting party to the CTA. So it's up to you, the trial sites and the investigator to ne negotiate either a CTA between the sponsor and the investigator and the sponsor and the trial site or uh, negotiate a three party agreement with the trial site and the investigator as the contracting parties. If the investigator does not become a contracting party to the CTA, um, it is common practice and recommendable to let the investigator sign a read and acknowledge section on the signature page of the CTA, where the investigator states that he or she has not only read the provisions um, of the CTA, um, but also acknowledges all the obligations addressed uh, or assigned to the investigator under the CTA and the clinical trial regulation, as well as all other applicable laws, of course. Uh, moreover, um, please make sure um, that you have a provision in the CTA in place that states that it is a general obligation of the trial site to ensure that the investigator fulfills its obligation assigned to him or to her in the CTA or by applicable laws such as um, the CTR. Now let's move forward to another important regulation, uh, the General Data Protection Regulation. I'm sure that you've uh, aware of the GDPR uh, and um, already came along um, um, uh, of the provisions of the G GDPR. The CTR clearly states that the provisions on data protection stated in the GDPR need to be observed in addition to the provisions of the CTR with regard to clinical trials. So both regulations are applicable in parallel. The GDPR requires a legal basis for the process of personal data. So when conducting a clinical trial, you are obtaining and processing personal data of study subjects. And for this process of personal data, even if it's pseudonymized data in case report forms, for example, this pseudonymized data is regarded personal data under the GDPR so that the requirements of the GDPR have to be observed with regard to this, uh, these um, pseudonymized data. And in order to process this personal um, pseudonymized data, uh, you need um, a specific legal basis. Um, in Germany, we don't have a specific legal provision in the German medicinal um, Products Act or in any privacy uh, specific privacy laws. So the legal basis for the process of personal data is the informed consent of the clinical trial subjects. Um, but it's um, up to the European member states to further develop such a legal basis. So just um, remember in Germany, we always need the informed consent of the trial subjects in order to be allowed to process their personal including pseudonymized data. And, um, and the way to obtain their uh, informed consent is um, informing them not only about the risks and benefits of the clinical trial, but also about the scope and the type of data you as the sponsor will process during and after the conduct of the clinical trial. So uh, if you've already read an ICF, you uh, may have noticed that the scope of the ICF is uh, uh, quite <laughs> wide. Uh, so we don't do not only have um, the uh, information given on the clinical trial itself, but uh, so many pages on the processing of the personal data. 
And um, in Germany, for example, it is quite common that the sponsor asks the child site to draft the ICF template, which will then be used to obtain the informed consent of the um, clinical trial subjects. Um, but please be aware that uh, the um, drafting of the ICF, which is to be submitted as part of the application documents and the approval procedures, this is um, the obligation, the regulatory obligation of the sponsor itself. So it's your obligation to ensure that all trial subjects have also been effectively informed in terms of data protection law and have given their consent to the processing of their personal data. Therefore, um, it is essential that the ICF template provided by the trial site is checked by you as the sponsor to ensure that it also complies with the GDPR and all applicable local data protection laws. Um, and just to give you an impression, which data protection provisions need to be uh, stipulated in the ICF, um, don't, uh, don't worry, we won't read this uh, section 40b, uh, paragraph 6 of the German Medicinals, um, Medicinal Products Act, but um, this is just to give you an impression of all the information uh, only governing the data processing in clinical trials, which needs to be stated in the ICF. So when drafting the ICF itself or when reviewing the ICF you have uh, received from the trial site, please make sure that all the requirements uh, which I've listed you here um, and which are stipulated in Section 40b, Paragraph 6 of the Arzneimittelgesetz, that all these requirements are covered in the ICF template, just to avoid that uh, you don't have a um, valid informed consent and uh, you don't um, you won't be uh, you then won't be able to um, work with the data you have obtained. Um, one last but really crucial um, point uh, or issue we are discussing with trial sites when negotiating clinical trial um, agreements is the remuneration of uh, so-called employee or um, service inventions. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background information to employee or service inventions in Germany. Um, with regard to inventions in Germany, um, many special aspects of the German Employee Inventions Act, the Arbeitnehmererfindungsgesetz, must be obs observed, uh, which either you yourself must comply with because you are established in Germany, or your contracting partner, the trial site, must comply with if employees, so their researchers, are employed in Germany. Um, the provisions of the German Employee Inventions Act aim to ensure that German employees receive a um, um, reasonable contribution or reasonable participation in inventions they made in the course of their employment if the employee exploits the invention in a commercial manner. The German employee or researcher then has the right to an appropriate contribution to this exploitation of the service or employee inventions and uh, for service inventions made for employees at a German university. This is further specific. Um, Section 42 of the um, German Employee Inventions Act also provides that in the event of the exploitation of the service invention by the German university, um, the, the amount of remuneration shall be 30% of the income generated by the in university through the exploitation of the service invention. Um, please note that um, if the trial site transfers the rights to the service inventions, uh, to a service invention, to a third party like you, uh, you as the sponsor of the clinical trial, it's the obligation of the trial site itself to compensate its researchers 
this obligation to compensate the employee always stays with the trial site as the employer, which means above all that the trial site has to pay the employee a reasonable co compensation for the transfer of rights to this employee inventions. Your company itself or you as the sponsor do not have to pay the employee inventors or researchers. So this is a common misunderstanding sometimes when negotiating clinical trials and employee inventions in Germany in general. However, it is usually the case that your German trial site will negotiate a specific provision in the CTA when it comes to the transfer of study inventions in general and now service inventions or employee inventions in particular. Um, and this provision will aim to ensure that separate remuneration is paid to the trial site in the event of the transfer of the service invention from the university to you as the sponsor. So if your contracting partner, the trial site, is legally obliged by the uh, requirements of the German Employee Inventions Act to remunerate its own employees, they do not want to bear these costs on their own as um, they must contractually transfer the service inventions due to the requirements of the CTA to you and cannot use it themselves. It is therefore important um, to determine whether such a remuneration of the employee invention or service invention the sponsor needs to pay to the university or the, to the trial site shall be already covered in um, the CTA itself which we always re uh, recommend agreeing on or uh, if this remuneration should be reserved uh, for a separate agreement to be concluded um, by the sponsor and the trial site afterwards. Finally, it um, is interesting to note that uh, Section 42 of the German Employee Inventions Act stipulates that employees of a German university have the right to decide whether or not to publish the results of their research. The right not to publish research results is referred to as the so-called negative publication right in Germany, negatives Publikationsrecht. Um, the spe special characteristic of this negatives Publikationsrecht is uh, that the university researcher cannot waive his negative publication right in advance towards his employer, so towards the university, the trial site. But it is common for the researcher, it is common practice in Germany at least, for the researcher to waive this right, uh, his, his or her negative right, vis-a-vis uh, -vis a third party like the sponsor, you as the contracting party of the university. Therefore, it may be um, necessary to obtain declarations from all university researchers involved in the conduct of the clinical trial. Otherwise, there is the risk that the researcher will not report the results made in the course of the clinical trial to the university and the university will then not be able to disclose the results to you due to a lack of knowledge. So. We need a specific waiver, um, the waiver of the so-called negative right uh, of publication um, with regard to this right not to disclose employee inventions and results uh, made by the university researcher. Um, we recommend attaching a specific template, a specific waiver to the CTA, which all researchers involved in the conduct of the clinical trial in Germany should sign, in which they waive their right not to disclose the results and employee inventions vis-a-vis -vis the sponsor, not the university. This is not enforceable, but it is uh, allowed to waive it towards you, the sponsor, the third party. And moreover, uh, as uh, stated on the right side, please make sure that uh, there is an obligation in the CTA that states that the university shall only involve employees in the conduct of the clinical trial who have previously signed such a waiver as 
provided for in the attachment to the CTA. So this is it. Many thanks for your attention for now. Um, any questions? Um, I didn't see any um, questions uh, for now, but I'll wait a few minutes to give you the time to uh, go through all the information provided in this short time frame. We will send you um, the video of today's uh, webinar and the slides you've seen um, right now after the webinar. So you are, of course, welcome to write an email uh, if you have any further general questions on the conduct of uh, clinical trials with medicinal products in um, the European Union and specifically in Germany. So as there are no further questions, many thanks again for your attention, uh, attention and uh, your patience today. And yeah, have a nice day.